Daniels, everybody. I am so thrilled to speak with you again. I enjoyed our talk so much on meta modernity, Japan, the the society, the art culture, and today I just it's really exciting to get into the Japanese uh, philosophy, the practices in light of that philosophy, the different schools. Uh, you're doing this fantastic class that everyone needs to sign up um, for. I, I was um, talking with Michelle. But one of the great tragedies is uh, it's very difficult to say here in America, I'm in Virginia, to find really good sources of um, education on Japanese thought, which I just find um, when I discovered it and read the first book, I see your um, uh, I saw uh, the wonderful Johannes did a talk on uh, on his channel in getting ready for your class since it's going to be at the Halcon Guild on In Praise of Shadows and, and thinking about that book. And I remember reading that about a decade ago and, and just going, oh, what is this? And kind of opening up an entire horizon that I'm extremely um, grateful for that has been really influential on my thinking and to help me escape. Not to, um, it's not the case that one abandons the West. You never, you know, if we're good dialectical thinkers, you're always seeing what's good here, what you find in an Aristotle, a Hume, in the Kyoto School and, and, and move on. But it really opened up horizons to new ways of thinking that I had not encountered before. So I think the entire internet and the entire world is quite fortunate that you are doing a class on those subjects because it is so difficult to find good places to, to learn about that. Would you tell us about the class? some of the some of the thinkers you're going through some of the ideas and and then just in general why you like Japanese uh, philosophy so much or why you lived there for a year and why you studied it so uh, you know all of that and again Zaruba always great to speak with you thank you so much for your time today yeah thank you for having me and for this great introduction um <laughs> yeah we, we have to right, we have to seduce people into into Japanese culture I mean it, it's like it's 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 in an inexhaustible treasure house, in, oh, yeah. in my opinion. What what you can really find there in mm. terms of literature, philosophy, art, and so forth. Oh, so yeah. right, last time we talked about more. About, I, I know we were kind of like um, um, well, weeping around a little bit about anime and manga, <laughs> all the good stuff, and. <laughs> and and kind of like talking also about the relevance of of Japanese, um, really also pop pop art, popular mm. culture in and its place in in what we could call this hyper modernity, meta modernity, post modernity, whatever you want to call it. Now this course that I will um, this will start on the first weekend on the first Saturday of, of April, so in in like one and a half weeks. Mm. Um, of one week, I think, when this video will go online. And there we really try to focus also then again on, on what philosophy has always been, namely philosophy as a way of life, mm. philosophy also as practice, practicing. Mm. Mm. And for this course, I've, I've chosen a couple of texts. One of them is from um, Tanizaki Junichiro, uh, a very famous novelist, and we will read his um, essay in Praise of Shadows. Mm -hmm. Then there will be two texts from the Kyoto School, Nishitani mm -hmm. and Ueda, and then one text from Heidegger, and mm -hmm. two texts from medieval Japanese um, thought. One, mm -hmm. the Ho I don't know, if, do you know that the Hojoki, an account yeah. of my hut? Mm -hmm. Very, very... Um, short text, the very illuminating text, and then one text from Dogen mm. with some commentary from Joanne Stambaugh. So that will be the program. And in four of the seminars, we will do practices. Why? Because it doesn't make any sense if philosophy is just an intellectual exercise that's done just for the sake of intellectual speculation or exercising. Mm. Philosophy that that's kind of like my my long-term vision let's say philosophy has to be integrated again let's say with the the greater whole of human life yeah. religion theology art practice and my course is a is a little contribution to that so we will we will practice with a lot of the texts dialogical practices that have kind of like emerged in this corner of the internet with Guy Sangstock and and John Mabeki and others and we will but we will also have time to to talk about the texts just as a, a normal philosophical conversation so that is kind of like what the course will be about
Marvelous. Um, all of those texts are gold. Everyone needs to read them. So everyone needs to take the class so they have someone who really knows the text to guide them through. And I really, um, what you're talking about practice, uh, I think is really, really important. I think in the, so if I'm speaking, say America or Virginia or whatever, um, I think there's kind of this idea that if you have the right ideas, you're good to go. Like, um, you know, maybe that comes from a Christian culture of salvation. If you believe in Jesus, then you're good. Now, I think that's a, a, a generalization. There is something about sanctification and so on and so forth. But there's this kind of idea where, for example, if you say, okay, you have the right idea. In a marriage, you're supposed to love your wife. All right, so you have the right idea. Well, everyone knows that that's not quite enough, right? <laughs> you actually have to, what does it mean to practice loving your wife, right? What does that look like? You can get into the Gary Chapman's love language. You can get into the fact that for her, you know, gifts don't really mean very much, but spending time together means a whole lot. But for other people, gifts are their love language, right? And so knowing that is a big deal. So there, so the general phrase that is true, love your, it's important to love your wife has to be particularized into the conditions of the particular relationship to figure out what exactly that means. And what those practices will look like will be relative to who you are as a person, where you live, who they are as a person. And therefore, all true generalities only matter in the particular way that they are manifest into a life that meets the conditionality of that situation. So it's not simply enough to know true things. You also have to know how to particularly manifest them. And, and you know, I, I, um, I think for me, when I think about In Praise of Shadows, which uh, Michelle and I, have in, inspired by you, have been talking a lot about by you and Johannes, um, a shadow is so, you know, throughout the text, he's talking about the beauty of shadows, how shadows add an aesthetic experience that's quite important. Um, he'll even talk about walking to the outhouse at the beginning and how there's a particular seeing the moonlight and the heating and all these different things. So there's a particular experience that um, opens one up to certain aesthetics um, and certain uh, beauties and depths that otherwise you can't get if that conditionality is not maintained. I like shadow because shadow is so interesting because it's not darkness and it's not light it's in this in between space right and it's very very um you can't have shadows at night if there's no moon there's no shadows at night if it's pure darkness there's no there's no shadow but likewise if you have the artificial light where there's just light everywhere you don't have shadows in order to get shadow you have to have this interesting blend of light and darkness, right? And the light is always trying to eat the darkness, right? You know, if you take a flashlight, boom, the shadow's gone, right? So, so in order to get that very special aesthetic experience that he's talking about, there's this really interesting conditionality that has to be upheld, that has to be held up and maintained. Likewise, for the experience of going to the bathroom to be this majestic, powerful thing, the bathroom has to be located on this side of the house. You have to walk through a certain hall that has windows a certain way so that the light comes through beautifully and creates this overall experience. There's a certain conditionality that has to be maintained. It's not merely enough to know that walking to the bathroom can be an interesting experience or aesthetically beautiful. It's not enough to know that shadows can create an interesting dynamic. You also have to create the conditions, ergo practice, put them into practice so that you can have that experience. Um, and it's very, and then in addition to um, practicing it, you also have to uphold it. You have to hold the conditions that make the shadow possible, that make the aesthetic experience possible. In my opinion, I'd be curious to hear what you think about that. That notion of make, finding a certain conditionality and then holding up that conditionality is very absent in the West. Now, not everywhere. I know there's a push in direction of embodiment and, and so on and so forth. But generally speaking, I feel as if an Eastern, more so an Eastern thought, that that dynamic of conditionality and upholding and honoring is very much at, at play. And therefore, and therefore that's why it would be so important to have practice be a, a crucial element of learning, um, learning Japanese philosophy. Yeah, I mean, one, one thing that, that comes to my mind very spontaneously, right? How, first thing, right? We don't even, we don't even notice what's going on in general that's that's like if something really something radical changes for example it is very normal today in western households that for example the tv is turned on all the time and this mm. is kind of like this static weird noise all the time and that's for example that's very strange but we don't we, we, we don't notice it because we're mm. kind of like we're getting used to it and and so it's the same thing with this kind of like excessive illumination that tamizaki in the essay laments about 
this is very normal today that that everything's illuminated if you grow up in a in a, in a big city for example um, but Tanizaki, right? And that's why these, those Japanese thinkers are so interesting because they are really, they're really born at this, this, this is, Japan is really this radical case because they really um, transformed their society in only one generation, yeah, really, 40 yeah. years from, let's say, a, a pre-modern society into a, into a modern industrial society. It's really radical when you think about it. And then people have, Right, like Tanizaki, he was born when that began, and he kind of like died when it was when it was mm. over. And there, you then really s notice a lot of things that are going on. So, for example, one thing that he mentions is that you don't in in Japan, traditionally speaking, illumination for the sake of illumination was a no go. You do not just illuminate every like the hallways and everything just so they are, are lit up. It, it would have only when it's a purpose, for example, you, you, you have a dark niche, for example, and you want to read something, then you need a light, right? A candlelight or so. But but only, right, he, he's, he felt that this, this illumination gets rid of all the darkness that is in the rooms. And that was creating really a depth and a kind of like a depth perception in, in the rooms. And when you then, and, and this is then, right, this is then this holding aspect, right? When you want to, let's say, when you want, really want to, when you see, okay, that phenomenon is precious mm. and there's something at stake, then, okay, then you also have to hold it up in a, in a certain sense. And then you have all sorts of right practices, forms of, of building, architecture, art, that kind of like play with those aspects. And that is that was, I think, very um, um, sophisticated in, in traditional Japanese culture, which is elaborated in Tanizaki's essay, right? You have the, the yokan example, you have even the example with the toilet, you have the example with the lacquerware. Mm. There are some examples really of, of everyday um, gadgets that you use. And even the gadgets, it's also an interesting thing. He, he, he thinks, he, he also thinks that all the gadgets are, are very alienating. Mm. They kind of like, they kind of like, they don't make sense in the kind of like in the Japanese experience of things. Mm. They kind of like, and that he, 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 in this essay, he wonders then, yeah, what would it, what would uh, like, how would Japanese versions of all those Western gadgets look like? How would Japanese yeah. science look like? Um, so these are all, these are all some of the speculations he he has in the in the in the essay. But really, the basic phenomenon is that things seem to lose their how would you call it moreness. They lose their moreness. They 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 all seem flat. They seem detached. This is and these are all symptoms of the meaning crisis. And and now, right then. Yeah, maybe I'll stop there. No, that was ma magnificent. Um, uh, you know, a few things. Um, there's something I like to call high order causality and low order causality or low order co complexity, high order complexity from an essay experiencing thinking. The idea of um, low order causality is you take a billet board, rolls across the table, hits another billet ball and it moves. Just basic causality. High order causality is where a billet ball rolls across the table, hits another billet ball. And you remember that time you played pool with your sister and then you go and call her. There is no direct observable causality between the memory of your sister and the billiard balls on the table. And yet the cause and effect is very real. And it's, it's just as tangible as the balls moving, but it can only be known in terms of the subject, the person. You have to kind of ontologically move between different kinds mm. of being. But it's very, very real. Um, what you're talking about, like, for example, if you live in a world where all of your light, you know, you have candlelight. Well, what's a candlelight? All right, we have a, a light and then it only goes so far and then there's darkness. The light only goes so far. Well, that could have a high order causality relationship where you start to think about thinking as needing to find a balance between unveiling and veiling. Uh, because if you overly unveil, there's no mystery and then you, everything's flat and dead and you get the meaning crisis. But then if there's no candle at all, you can't read. Hmm. Um, so there has to be this interesting bothness that's going on that yeah. the bothness points to the moreness that if you are not architect in your um, setting, in your architecture, in your daily life, 
having that kind of spoken to you by the very environment that you're in, it's very easy to then think that thinking's at its best when you just illuminate everything. Artificial lighting. Uh, no, you can be up until two in the morning and see just fine because you have lighting. There's no structure to the days. It's all just day. It's all work, productivity, efficiency. Why are you going to bed? You can be up looking at light. If there was no artificial light, you wouldn't feel bad about going to bed. Like this whole culture of never sleeping and always working yeah, yeah, or yeah. whatever, yeah, which yeah. kind of generates in the West, which then of course goes in the direction of instrumental rationality, all these different things. All of these follow one another in terms of high order complexity and high order causality of which um, we often miss because we only think about causality in terms of low order. You know, billiard balls hitting one another. We don't think about the existence of artificial lighting impacting philosophy, impacting the formation of rationality into instrumental rationality. That's very real. That's something the West has not been good at. My impression is that the East has generally understood, understood that a whole lot better. And they've kind of catered around. I mean, you see that in Praise of Shadows. You see that in these different works. I mean, you're also talking about the white noise of the television screen. Um, right there, there's a kind of sense in which the environment doesn't matter in the West. The TV can be on, noise can be going on, it doesn't matter. Where if you instead have a way of thinking that is, we have to maintain the conditions of the shadow per se, you know, the kind of conditions impacts the environment, then you become very aware on if the TV is on or off. You become very aware of how the lighting comes through the window and how all of those things come together to create a kind of atmosphere that cannot be reduced to a single item in the room. This is what's very interesting. I was thinking about this as you were talking. So the West can be very empirical, can be very, you know, kind of observe everything. Can you observe an atmosphere? Can you look at negative space? Can you look at silence, right? Yes, no, kind of. You can kind of see an atmosphere, but not really. It's kind of weird in this between space, if you will. Well, in the West, if the only things that are real are the things you can empirically observe, there's no such thing as atmosphere. There's no such thing as moreness. There's no such thing as any of these things. Um, but if you take seriously what we're talking about regarding Japanese thought, um, atmosphere is incredibly consequential. And that also would suggest that some of the most important dimensions of human life are these things that are in these between spaces, I almost want to call it, where atmosphere is seeable, but it's not seeable, where the candlelight illuminates, but it also doesn't illuminate, where a shadow is darkness, but it's also not reducible to darkness. That kind of betweenness, um, Michelle put it really well, uh, we were talking about in Praise of Shadows, and then I'll pass it back to you. She was saying that um, kind of in America, we'll ask, is the light, is the light on or off? where in Praise of Shadows were asked, how is the light on? You know, how is the light on versus a binary, is it off or is it on? So similarly, if we go back to philosophy, it's not merely in the West you could say, do you have the right ideas or the wrong ideas? In the, in the East, you have this ideas of like, how are these ideas right? How are they practiced? How are, how are they brought into reality given certain conditions that are then held and upheld? That whole line of thinking of the upholding and the conditionality and the how, I think that not being present in Western thought has absolutely contributed to the meaning crisis. I think it's absolutely contributed um, to, to some of the, the problems you see today. Mm. So that, that, was, that was excellent, especially with um, what you said about the in-betweenness. Mm. That is a topic that will come back all the time, this kind mm. of like ontology of the middle, mm. this mm. kind of like in Ishitani, the, the middle mode and, and the, the middle is very important. For those of you who, who also listen to John Lovecki, he's talking about this all the time, trying to find this middle space mm. between emanation and emergence, this kind of like middle space of the, the, the in the circumcessional interpenetration, the middle between the one and the many or the many and the one. Mm. And meditation is also life and death, death and life. That that's that's one topic that's very important also for Zen, for Zen Buddhism. Mm. And the practices really help us to to get into that middle mode and hold ourselves there. Why? Because it is kind of like the optimal space where where we have kind of like the optimal. Where, let's say where meaning even arises. I would say. This is what you said with unveiling and veiling. We can't have just darkness and we also can't have just light, but we need, we need to have this 
stereoscopic vision that is able to see both, right? Or is, is, is a vision that is able to, to both um, be appreciative of light and darkness, life and death, the up and the down, let's say. And that's, that's kind of what many of those texts are about. And what we also try to do with those dialogical practices why is this okay? And I will also say this. Why is this important for metal modernity? So last time we really talked about art, right? Mm. The, the Ghibli movies and those wonderful, Absolutely. wonderful artworks. <laughs> Absolutely. Freaking um, lovely. I mean, and it, they still keep going. That's <laughs> yeah. uh, the, like, like um, you, you can be sure that there is at least that all every year there are a few good anime shows oh, yeah. that are coming out from Japan. Oh yeah, and, and also movies. And, but why is this important? Um, that the, the Kyoto School philosophers saw that kind of like philosophy is ending. We are yeah. going into we are just this is we are just going into a into a dark alley where where there's a nothing nothing fruitful um, um, comes along and philosophy is slowly but surely dying. Heidegger, Heidegger really um, makes this clear, right? He has this essay from the sixties on the end of philosophy. Mm. How is it ending? by the compartmentalization of every branch of the sciences. Mm. This is what kind of like Kant had in view. Mm. It's, it's not about, so about natural sciences, this kind of like, it's more, but it's more about Kant had this vision, right? There's a, there's a department, so to say, or, or uh, for every branch of the sciences. So they have, they're, they're like science, the, the knowledge of man kind of like, expands and then we have a field for every science mm. this is kind of we have the anthropology Ooh. we have psychology we have we have <clears throat> so all the sciences are kind of like branched out and and so so the the the, the general knowledge of all human of, of the human being is so say, taken care of but that and this is heidegger's argument what then happens is philosophy is because right, science doesn't care about this this moreness that we were talking about, That's right. and then philosophy, philosophy, like what philosophy is becoming is kind of like a like a what is it, a Hilfswissenschaft, a kind of like mm. a helping science for the for the other sciences. So kind of like so that we do better epistemology, so we can do better math or, or better physics and something like that. Um, that's kind of like the fate of philosophy. It ends in this kind of like branching out of all the fields of knowledge. Mm. That that is that is Heidegger's argument. Mm. Now, when and that's causing the meaning crisis. That's causing also this kind of like um, strange um, um, condition of modern philosophy departments at, at universities, and that's causing really that. We don't have a knowledge to hold ourselves in that moreness or in that in-between space. So the answer to matter modernity coming from Zen and from, let's say, the Kyoto School philosophers who are, who are also um, very influenced by, by Neoplatonism, Christian Neoplatonism, they have this insight, right? We can't just have um, propositional knowledge, but we need participatory knowledge. We need to practice this. We need to have philosophy as a way of life. Think of, for example, right, Pierre Hadot. That's a, a very good example who tried to, to bring this back in going back to antiquity, Greek philosophy. Because when we practice this and we learn to hold ourselves, we, we in that, that moreness, so to say, then only then we can, we can have this lift, this engaged knowing, let's call it like that, this engaged knowing with with the world and reality and the, the uh, our environment, but we can't have it only by propositional knowledge or by propositional faith. What you were saying in the beginning, kind of like with what many Christian denominations today think mm -hmm. is um, so, so that's kind of like the, right those things. Oh, yeah. I, don't, I don't know if Ghibli movies and Neoplate, so this kind of like. They go Philosophy together. as a practice. 
if this is somehow related. Well, Ghibli um, forms, Ghibli movies are <laughs> platonic forms, I thought. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, yeah, right, because because there you, you don't have contempt, let's say, for for any otherworldly ontology, like often in, 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 in the West, where right? then it's it's it, 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 it right i mean I, I only have to think about right spirited away yeah we are spirit, exactly we are spirited away into a let's say an other world that is however not completely detached but makes mm. sense really the but the intelligible world and many people many people have this have those experiences that there is right there's something like there's transcendence like this mm. Um, and that's so okay. Now, now, now you, now you, you we've brought together Ghibli. Yeah, of course we have. Yeah, it makes probably, perfect. Now, when I think it, it makes perfect sense. Every, every time I hear the Path of the Wind with Joe Hisashi, <laughs> the version on the Gr Grissom project, which everyone needs to go go listen to that channel, I'm taken to the the perfection. Uh, you know, you don't get much better than the the, the music out of my neighbor Toto Toto. Um, a few things you said the phrase field of science, and that just struck me. Now I'm thinking about like field if it's not growing anything because you don't bring in seeds from other um areas. It just turns into like a T.S. Eliot wasteland. So now I want to kind of like do a poem on that or something. Fields of study. Fields fields of science as opposed to communities of studies and science it's interesting that kind of wordplay there um you know you were talking about practice it's um basically without practice um a paradox must be an effacing contradiction so you could say without um without practice paradox must be contradiction because a because a paradox when we were saying you need both light and darkness well that doesn't make sense it makes perfect sense in practice it just doesn't make sense as a point per se. But when you practice it through time and you bring it together in terms yeah. of condition, it makes perfect yeah. sense. But without practice, um, paradox is not possible, only contradiction. And a paradox is kind of like a whole together of, of opposites, yeah. if we use that language. And that's also why, um, now I'm using contradiction not necessarily as like a Todd McGowan in terms of Hegel, where, where contradiction is kind of the tension that pushes forward. I'm just talking about logic. Um, and uh, so you have to have practice to make sense of paradox. And there's something, this is what's interesting. There is something about the human being of which is optimized by paradox. It is actually paradox that seems to be necessary for finding meaning. Now, critically, paradox does not mean there can't be progress per se. There can't be advancement. In the same way that when we say we always need some degree of veiling, that doesn't mean there can't be like walking forward toward the veil or moving one veil and finding a new veil and keep going. That doesn't mean you can't, you can't have progress with a veiling. In the same way that in Dante, which is extraordinary, there's this notion of God is a mystery, which is that means that the more you learn about God, the more you find there's more to know. So it's not mystery like a wall, but it's more like you go and it kind of becomes grander and pulls you forth. So when we talk about paradox mystery, I think in the West, we've been so trained to hear that and think about like a wall that you can't advance for, like you can't go through. But what it really means is an ever deepening penetration per se, an ever deepening advancement. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and for me, the great symbol of that is in fact Beatrix from Dante, which is when they're down in the purgatorio, she can't smile for Dante because it would kill him because it's too grand. But as he ascends, as he overcomes his sins per se, as he goes, then he can see more of her smile um, and as he advances and goes high and higher. So paradox, an ontology of paradox is in fact a, is going to beget a philosophy that takes seriously mystery veils and paradox of which then will measure progress in terms of an ever deepening mystery, a penetration that increases in its beauty, its goodness and its truth, but there's still something to keep going. And I think all that comes together to create something that is almost like a flow state, something where there's kind of this timelessness to it. There's this perpetual engagement. I think the flow state seems to me to be very philosophically rich and it would also seem to be when we talk about you know i was talking about this magical atmosphere you can get that's the conditionality to be maintained can you observe that can you not likewise can you empirically observe flow, flow states kind of yes no i mean it kind of is in this weird between space but there's something also about flow states being about um holding certain conditionalities and upholding them of which then atmospheres which i guess are the setting version of flow state per se if we're using that term it's all about this radical conditionality and the practices which uphold them hold them up and keep them up 
but not in a, but not clutch them. You know, that's the um, the bird image that Michelle that we always talk about. You know, th th there's a bird sitting in your hand and your hand is open. Then you really have a relationship with that bird. But if you're clutching it around the feet, well, maybe you just own it and the bird can't fly and it's and it's instrumentalized. You have to have this open handness. And there's something about conditions that are held up and like learning the practices to hold things like this as opposed to with a clutch fist and then figuring out what are the conditions that need to be held like this to create flow right. states, to create certain atmospheres of which cannot be reduced to mere observable phenomena because they right. seem to be something emergent from the symphony of all of the things coming coming together. Mm -hmm. No, that, that was beautiful, right? I mean, letting go, the releasement is, right? This is what Meister Eckhart, right? The German mm. mystic from the 13th century called this practice, let's say. Mm. We will also... We do not call it releasement, but releasement, I think, is kind of like the way the, the, the comportment that you have in the middle mode. And in the middle mode, what you have is this ever deepening of the contradictions. Yes. Not a kind of, right? Not, not that we, we, we get rid of them or so, or, or, but we, we, we explore them existentially and, and this does get a, a greater clarity about them. And that's also, um, mirrored in the in the this is called right the, the sokuhi logic or see mm. the non logic that that nishida and nishitani employ so they're really they're really also um elaborating on this this logic of paradoxicality and mm. this is also right what you basically do in, in zen practice when you when you get the koan the koan kind of like is is it's, it's similar to what in in the socratic dialectic what is with aporia, right? You're thrown into an, in, in an apparatic state where something, right? Something doesn't make any sense because it's paradoxical or contradictory, let's say. Mm. And then you, you have to, right? You have to meditate upon it. You have to practice upon it. You have to think about it. And some, right? Then at some point, maybe you can get have a breakthrough maybe in Eckhart's language again mm. and and that's that's all right my my they, they, this is right, my course will be too short maybe, <laughs> to explore this but um, um in in a sense dialogical practice is is a little bit similar because it also it can throw you into a space of of contradictions and then mm. we, we have to learn to hold them not 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 to and this, this, this requires a kind of flexibility of the intellect and, and also a kind of, um, 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 let's say, humility in, 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 in regarding what we are doing and also appreciation of that kind of mystery. Mm. Um, that, that's, I think, those things are, are all very important. Mm. Mm. Well, and it's, you see, one of the great challenges is if we go, okay, the... Uh, optimal way of philosophical and ontologically and every fancy word I can think of being is something like this. Okay, so this is upholding and this is the condition. Well, now my arm's getting tired. Now I have to go eat. You know, I'm in time, right? So there's movement, so there's change. How do I maintain this through time? That becomes where you need practices. That's where you say, well, maybe I can lower my arm and let it rest a little bit and that's okay. Maybe I can move it back and forth and that's okay. Like if, if there wasn't time, um, well, then all we'd have to do is find the right up, you know, method of upholding, find the right conditions and then set it and forget it. We leave it alone. But because we're in time, we have to flow. We have to adjust the condition. The light moves across the room. So if we want to maintain shadows, we might have to move objects uh, and then pay attention to the room to know how the objects have to be moved and so, so forth. In the West, what we've tried to do is think about the goal of philosophy is to find the non-contingent, you know, that, that it doesn't, there's no contingency. It's true under all circumstance. It's objectively true. There's no personal element. Um, once you think it, once you discover it, you're done, you're set, you're good to go. And, you know, how wonderful would it be, man? You know, if you could just find the right ideas and once you think them, your life's perfect. You don't have to worry about anything anymore. But that's not how it is. You know, that's not to say there's some truth to it because 
let's say like, you know, a lot of what, you know, I, I like to talk about is kind of conditionality, which is this between space, between absolutism and rel hard relativism, this kind of conditionality that's personal, which brings into mind, you mentioned something that's like um, Pamier, personal knowledge, uh, you know, different people. Um, but there's something to be said about the idea of conditionality itself is non-contingent. That the, the, like, there's something about that idea that's non-contingent, but but the idea is that you didn't have to practice the idea to make it real in your life. And that then brings it into the realm of conditionality. Um, that brings it into the realm of practicing. And so in the West, but of course, here's the funny thing. Um, my friend Bernard Hankins once said this, and I just adored it. He said, you know, the problem with objectivity is that you have to be an object. You know, you have to be an object to be objective. So if your goal in the West is objectivity, if you don't, if it depends on what you mean by that. In some sense, it's an okay term. It's just a bit like impassion. You know, you don't, you want to be dispassionate in a courtroom so that you're not bringing your emotions. You read the law. If that's what you mean, that's fine. But there is something funny where the only way to truly be objective is to be an object. Well, then you're lifeless. Then you're dead. You're just a body. Up, oh, meaning crisis. So, you know, if you don't have conditionality, but then if you go to the other side and you're like, well, let's have hard relativism where everything's truth is okay. Well, then it's all atomized. Everything comes apart. There's no center to hold it. So conditionality is a middle ground where you say, it's kind of like this. You say, if the, um, you know, if the flower vase is located right here at this time, there's going to be a shadow that goes across the floor right here. That is a objective fact that will occur. But that won't occur unless you put the flower vase right there for the sun to hit it in a certain way. So there's an object, there's a facticity, there's an objectivity, but there's also a doing the practice to create the condition, to realize the conditions in which that can occur. And so that conditionality, conditionalism, as I kind of like to call it, um, that to me is what, that's why practice has to be part of this. Uh, because otherwise you're just in another you know, you're just in another kind of realm of dis, yeah. you know, impersonal thinking that will not give rise to you doing the things that you need to do to enter those flow states and atmospheres that are that create these extraordinary aesthetic and uh, fully alive uh, experiences. Yeah. So, um, right, and and I think all spiritual traditions in 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 the world have this kind of like let's say Platonist grammar. It doesn't just, right? It's not, it's not enough to give an account of the good, what it is, but you need to give an account how to, to come into greater conformity with it, to, how to have a right relationship to the good. It, but it does, I mean, really the, the simplest example I can think of, it doesn't just, right? It's not enough to say, oh, I, I line out in five sentences what a good life is. You also need to live it. <laughs> I mean, right? Shoot! <laughs> Shoot! Oh, oh no! <laughs> Shoot! I thought I could just write it down. Oh no! I got to do things. No, you're. That's a good way to put it. That's a great way um, to put it. But but that's really that's really the essence of, of 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 let's say let's say Platonism in that sense, right? And and it's also important, right? The, the, in the analogy of the cave, right? We don't just we don't just go into one direction towards the summit. We also always come back to the cave. Yes. It's always up and down. That's in the in the in the aspirational anagogic movement. The coming back is always implied. And and if we do that right, I think we are in a kind of middle zone where we both have right. The cave is there, and we hold ourselves to to let's say other people those people in the cave, but we also hold ourselves in the right, um, we have this right tension, let's say, between the, the, the lower levels and the upper levels. Oh, yes. um, and what was Plato's practice for this was, of course, dialectics. Absolutely. That's, that was his um, um, practice, how we can, how we can um, participate, let's say, with the good. So and that's and that's why right, the Kyoto School philosophers really come back to, to again, Neoplatonism and Zen. And they really share this, this let's say, this practical attitude. So mm. it's really fair to criticize. Or it's, <clears throat> it's even fair to maybe say that even in Buddhism, even if they have never heard of Plato, that they kind of like have a, a Platonist grammar or that maybe Platonism has a Zen grammar in that sense. This is mm. the... It, it, it's more really it's it's 
what this course really in, in the beginning tries to do is really in the project, what also John Rebecca or Guy Sengstock are doing, that we kind of like revive the spiritual grammar of the, of the, of the world by bringing back, let's say, also the monastery into the space of learning. Mm. Not just that we again converse about ideas and kind of like exchange knowledge, which is fine, but that we also need the practices and the, right a bunch of practices as in the in the medieval monasteries or in the in the let's say in the Zen monasteries mm. that, that all of these things have to come together and it's the same with right intellect and and maybe faith all of oh, these yeah. things but, but because what what is also exacerbating the meaning crisis and that is one of Nishitani's central arguments is for example that science and religion rationality and faith are now all opposing each other and kind of like exacerbating the meaning crisis. Yep. And that's why we need to bring all those contradictory elements together. And I would argue that, that in, in, that's in Neoplatonism and Zen and in the Kyoto school and even in Ghibli movies, <laughs> all of these things, all of these things kind of like find a kind of a broad back together in a kind of harmony where you where we where those those tensions are alive and and generative and and productive and and creating flow cre creating dynamics yeah, excellent excellent you know a, a, a bunch of it so so first off what you were talking about going up and coming down i think something that has really hurt um if we're talking america or the west i know these are always uh, general categories of different things you know there's a lot of emphasis on jesus's ascension or god being in heaven but there's a there's kind of a forgetting that if we follow the first testament you know god is yeah. present and then he kind of goes more upward he doesn't speak as directly except when jesus yeah. is baptized but then jesus comes down and then when jesus goes up the holy spirit comes down <laughs> and so there's yeah. always a yeah. bothness that I think in the West there's kind of this emphasis on going upward and so you leave the world behind but but that's why you have to always remember in Christianity you're talking about a trinity and what ends up happening is people use the word God God becomes a simile for father father is in heaven disembodied and then it all the the, the bothness then you, have, then you have Freud basically yeah and then when you get the you get a <laughs> you get a horizontal without any vertical and yeah. you get you know you get all the psychoanalytical problems that people have without any way to connect it together because they're in their head and they don't think about possibilities of bringing it out into the world and people are all sort of isolated in their head because that's the upper world and there's no it's like that's what you're supposed to keep it because everything's supposed to go up everything's supposed to go into heaven everything's supposed to go into your head and you're supposed to keep it there and toughen it out or something like that and then you blow up or you know if the people who it gets stuck in their head then it's like in Foucault you just stuff them in the prisons or whatever and you don't talk to about them um so there's this kind of pushing upward it's like boiling pressure that's happened in the West and then everything blows up because you have the wrong metaphoric thinking and then as we were saying at the beginning there's high order complexity metaphors matter metaphors kind of structure everyone's thinking and if you're thinking always in terms of ascending and never coming back down because down is bad up is good and then going to the body to the mind is good going into heaven is good then everything goes in that direction to the point and then it create becomes pathological uh, because there's no dialectic you know, you can't have any of that dialectic. I mean, so much in Freud is like bringing it back. It's like Hegel talking about the, um, you know, the abstract negation and the concrete. You know, Freud wants to bring you into the concrete, like bring you into the real, kind of the Lacan he's talking about. And unless you do that, you never get this dialectical balance that is actually what you need. I think, in quote unquote, harmony that you need. I think harmony is a really good word um, because if we have a symphony orchestra playing Beethoven's Ninth, it yeah. takes a single note to screw it all up, you know, a single note to mess it all up. If the if the friggin' trumpet goes off at the wrong time, oh, the whole thing can be destroyed. Or kind of like, oh, ugh. like maybe 99.9% .9 of it is great, but everyone afterwards is like, guys, what was up with that trumpet? <laughs> you know, that's the only thing they remember. Is that at the 22-minute mark, there was a trumpet that went off for five seconds? What the heck? So harmony is very, very delicate. But harmony creates a beauty and a music that is not possible otherwise. So likewise, philosophy is primarily in the business of quote unquote harmonies, which are fragile and you need them all. And because they are fragile, practices of upholding are critical in the same way that because a single misplaced trumpet note in a harmony can ruin all of the Beethoven performance, the skill 
The talent of the musicians is critical. Philosophies, philosophers don't talk enough about skill or talent or practices. All of those are really important. Uh, an image that came to mind, it's kind of like what we do is we treat, um, we treat recipes like fo food in philosophy. We're like, we have our recipe, eat it, Daniel. And you go, I, I, can't, I can't eat paper, man. You have to like take the recipe and turn it into food. You know, you have to take the ideas and then put them together. And then recipes are interesting because if you have too much salt, it tastes bad. If you have too much of one ingredient, it tastes bad. There's a particular weighing, a particular amount and distribution of the ingredients that if not done correctly in practice, you can't just read the recipe and the food appear. You have to practice it and have the skill to rightly practice the recipe. If you cannot do that, the food will not be good. Um, and, and you see, that's kind of what I think we've messed up. I think theology generally got this a little better because you had orthodoxy and orthopraxy. You had the, okay, you've got the right, you know, theologians are like, mm -hmm. you're a theologian, but are you going out and helping the poor? Are you taking care of the orphans? You know, there was always this kind of skepticism. It's like, eh, you know, theology matters, but also you can use it to escape practicing. You got to be careful with that. And the pastor has to um, preach to a congregation of blacksmiths and uh, mothers and people in the field. They couldn't just live in academia or whatever. Um, but we've kind of lost that as we've moved away from theology. And as a result, we think that we can eat by reading recipes, basically is what's happening in the West. We think that we can eat food by reading recipes, that just reading the recipe will be enough. And so we never develop the skills. We never go get the material. We never go get the ingredients. We never learn how to use the oven. And then we wonder why we're all starving to death, ergo a meaning crisis. Um, and that's where I think Japanese uh, philosophy, Japanese thinking is so critical because they understand the need to, uh, they, they understand all of those tensions, if you will, that precisely because there's a tension though, that's why when it all works out, it's so wonderful. It is hard to make good food. It is hard to live a good life because of all of these factors. It is very difficult to have a beautiful performance of Beethoven's Ninth, but that's precisely why they can create so much meaning. That's precisely why they can make life feel so good. So even though everything we're saying is kind of like, oh crap, that's a lot guys. Well, but no, that's the challenge. That's like when you like run a marathon and you didn't think you could do it and you succeed, you're like, I can do it. And there's like something wonderful about that. Um, and it gives like life a feeling of being alive. Likewise, this um, entire gambit of practices that have to be done are precisely the very fact that those have to be done is why life can be good. Why life can have a beauty, a truth and a goodness. We just have to... Uh, do it. And the, the only thing I would I would add, but this was wonderful, by the way. You're um, wonderful. The, the, <laughs> Anyone I can talk about Ghibli films, I'm like, yes. <laughs> the, the, the only thing, right, I would I would add to that, right, um, is I, I, I don't, right, I don't want to even to, right, this is not just about the religious practice. Sure. But, and especially in Japan, what also happened then those let's say that the practice the initial religious practice is then kind of like dripping out also into art just mm. as in the west right think of religious art right that's very off of praxis right what you said um so it's it's not just that that this is like an exercise then again in, in maybe that we we understand something better but it then it's really also important for Maybe think of Heidegger's text and building dwelling thinking. Mm. So this practice that we are here doing is not just is not just for the sake of philosophy, but it also it, it affects every every branch of your life. Mm. It, it affects every everything you do in life. It, it your relationships, how you treat other people, how you build things, how you you let's say how you how you dwell, how you think. All those things are. All those things are influenced by the by the practices, and that's then also right. Um, one also one horrible schism in the West is is again this um, that that often re right religion is really at odds with science, mm -hmm. and that that's I mean that, that's not I mean this is also like like I think in in the Kyoto School. Um, it, it's not such a major theme, but it is a theme. Embodiment. Yeah, yeah. Right. Goethe, Goethe was very clear about this, right? That the body as a tool of, of let's say, doing science, not not this really abstract science, 
but the body let's say as a tool of science why because when you when when you practice embodiment when when you get let's say when you when you are able to to be be more aware let's say of what's going on if you let's say if you if you let's say you practice this and you, you become become more centered you become more fluent in, in mm. how you you move let's say what then happens is that you also get a deeper insight into what reality is I then of a sudden you, you see it's a, you see the depth perspective you see the shadows so that even even our body is is an is a tool of doing science that's completely forgotten by modern science because we, right it's intersubjective it must hold true even if you right it, under all circumstances but it right and that's then when you think about um, i think what's his name no, i think mafieu ricard he's a he was a neuroscientist and he became a he became a monk in tibet hmm. because he realized yeah, I can't just study the mind conceptually or, or with, let's say, with, with uh, let's say, experiments in the laboratory. I actually have to do this and, and, and cultivate my body in such a way that I can have insights into the mind. It's not, and, and that's why many neuroscientists, and I include John Levakey, but there are others as well, um, also in America, who, who do science because they understand this. That, that, that the body plays an inter integral role in the doing of the science. And then, then I can even, that's another vision I have, then I can even see, okay, we can bring science back to with religion, back with art. We can actually um, unify all those things if we accept this kind of like, spiritual grammar and that practice is necessary and good and that 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 we, we 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 cannot push the human being away so to say we have to include um, um personal transformation and personal cultivation in in all endeavors we undertake in life whether they are artistic or scientific Magnificent. I, it brings to mind, um, I think one of the mistakes we make is we tend to think that it's fields that make discoveries as opposed to individuals. We go, science has discovered yeah. X, Y, and Z. Yeah. I think a very interesting book, um, it's called Against Method by Paul Feyerbend. I can never say his name. And he talks about Galileo. And he makes this point where he says, you know, we always talk about Galileo versus the church. And we tend to forget that basically all the scientists were against him as well, uh, that he was kind of alone because everyone was in an Aristotelian paradigm, you know, of the physics or whatever. And so, so what's very important is that Ga Galileo, we know, we will now say that Galileo represents science right? Really, it's more so the case that kind of Galileo represents Galileo in some respects. And what, fire, and what he wants to talk about in Against Method is he wants to say that very often the big scientific discoveries are due to kind of this um, individual, this rugged individual who really believes in something and kind of fights through and kind of sticks to it, even though nobody else believes in it. And then eventually the, you know, we, had, we observe the eclipse. I mean, people didn't like Einstein too much. I mean, it depends on who you talk to until you observe the eclipse, right? And then, you know, that study and like, oh, well, he's got evidence now. Likewise with Galileo, they're like, this guy's nuts until you have the experiments. And then people are like, oh, now the, the, the reason I think that's important is because I'm quite certain that Galileo probably had days where he's like, this sucks. I'm not going to do this. I'm just going to like, everyone hates me. I'm just going to like uh, his thoughts, maybe his emotions got the best of him and uh, could have gotten the best of him. And then he just kind of fell in line because, you know, it was really difficult. Um, you know, everyone has different personalities, but I don't think it would be hard to uh, believe that Galileo probably had doubts and that in order to keep doing what he was doing, he had to um, engage in practices of calming his mind. He had to engage in practices of building trust in himself. He had to engage in practices of not getting swept up in the mob. Now, I don't think he helped himself when he attacked the Pope, who he was friends with at the end of his book, when they said he wasn't going to do that. So maybe, you know, we don't want to, you know, there was, we all make mistakes. But generally speaking, if we, if we believe that it's fields, you know, entire disciplines that make the big discoveries, then you can de-emphasize the role of individual practices because the fields figure it out. 
you know, literature gave us The Sound and the Fury. Yeah. Literature gave us Hamlet. Literature gave us Shakespeare. No, 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 no. Shakespeare gave us Hamlet. Shakespeare gave us Othello. Um, you know, Cleopatra, you know, all these different ways. Faulkner gave us Absalom, Absalom. And now afterwards, we call it literature. But what we tend to do is think of it as a field. And it's kind of this collective thing, which don't get me wrong, the collective has a necessary role that gets us into that entire discussion. But the point is that very often the paradigm, like the Kuhnian paradigm shifts, the big works, do not have the support of the field. I mean, read the beginning of The Sound of the Fury. It's like stream of cut. Joyce, people didn't, I don't think he could print double nairs. I don't think anyone wanted to print it. It was really hard. I, did he have to get a private press? I mean, I know the, the Virginia Woolf and her husband. Anyway, I, it was not, it's not like now we're like, of course anyone would print Ulysses. At the time, no, 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 not so easy. I, I do think Elliot had to get printed by the wolves. I, I, but, but the same with Galileo. He, they didn't have the support of the scientific community. But what we've done is we've said science versus religion. And that doesn't capture it at all. But if you think that way, then fields make discoveries and fields aren't people. Fields don't need personal practices to control the mind and do all these other things. And that contributes to the um, disembodiment that you see in Western thinking. And uh, you know, uh, and then I'll hand it back to you. You know, Johannes recently did this wonderful talk with um, act, act on memory and different things. And it actually, I lied in bed thinking about memory a lot, like a crazy person, because I'm usually a crazy person. But I was thinking about how difficult, like, you know, we're talking about conditionality, right? Like if I'm going to remember that time when I was four year old, no, I guess I was eight and my brothers and I were racing down the hill behind the yard and I was in a trash can and I was rolling down the trash can because I was an idiot, but it was a lot of fun. Um, in order to remember that correctly, I have to maintain the conditions and resist the temptation to imagine my cousin Stephen there because Stephen was not there. But for some reason you can like, the thought can enter your head and what is a memory can turn into a creation just like that right? It can turn into a fabrication because both of them exist in the same, I want to call it the thinking there space because you're here, but you're also there. So you're thinking there. It is really difficult to maintain a memory and to hold to a memory without like imagination breaking through, right? But if we lose memory, Johannes does so much and it's exactly right. We lose our humanity, right? So we have to maintain a certain practice, like a meditative practice. Like if you're meditating, there, you have to maintain that state and all of these distractions are flying in. You have to maintain it. If you don't learn to meditate, then next time you're in that business meeting and you have a bad, you know, you, you, you get angry and it enters your head, you might not be able to control it. And it might just fly out of you. You knew the philosophical premise that anger is bad, but because you didn't do the practice to control your mind, when you get in the business meeting, you express your anger and now you lost your job. Very practical consequence potentially as a result of not bringing together idea and practice. And likewise, if you don't realize you have to work to maintain memory, it can get infused with imagination, thus changing the memory, thus changing identity and you not even realizing it, it is occurring. So maintaining condition, upholding, holding, you know, I know Guy, and I'll give it back, you know, the talking of the holding, holding being, observing being, so it doesn't turn into beings, diffused instrumental rationality, you know, holding yourself correctly in a house of being so that it becomes a home, yeah. Yeah. you know, holding, it all goes together in those ways. Yeah. I think one, one point I, I would like to raise again, mm. there's, I read an essay um, it's called Commuting Between Zen and Philosophy by uh, Brad Davis, who is a mm. very famous, uh, not famous, um, he's, a, he's a Kyoto School scholar from America, mm. very accomplished in that, that particular area of study. Um, but he wrote this essay, um, and it was more or less about this, right, you're in Kyoto, and you have, the, you, you have the philosophy department at the university, and then you have the, the Zen monastery. And the Kyoto school guys and he himself, they were always commuting between those. Mm. So mm. the right, this, this, is, this is this problem, and this is a Western thing, basically, right? That the universities came, but they have no, no place for the practices. Mm. And then you have the, the Zen monastery and they always had to commute because of this kind of like structural, let's call it structural insufficiency of the Western um, university. Because again, we, I mean, we, we just outlined this before, right? Because it doesn't, modern science doesn't really have a, 
have, but it, we, we push everything to the fields with literature departments and sociology departments and philosophy departments, but we don't have a practice department. Um, I mean, over there, they have sports and everything, right? They have like, <laughs> but we don't have a practice department. Huh. Really. Um, and then, then we, we, we are kind of like forced to, to commune between those institutions that, uh, that offer those practices. Hmm. So, and that's, that's, I mean, I mean, someone like Viveki, right? He sees this clearly. And he, he even said in a recent interview that his dream is to have a place where, where one can practice all those what he calls an ecology of practices hmm. such that we can cultivate philosophy and cultivate wisdom. Hmm. Um, but the, the, the modern university has, and, and now I will say this, what then happens is that void gets filled with other things. Then yeah. you start and you start to party like, like mad and oh, learning yeah. is who, who, who learns you in the, in the, uh, and, and it's not really about wisdom, but about something that kind of like the culture, the cultural norms, the cultural yeah. fads are dictating and, and then you, you really lose that. Then you basically, right. I mean, there is all this talk about, um, right? What is it? Um, prolonged um, adolescence, kind of like adolescence um, expanding until twenty-five, thirty, in, 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 and and then, uh, yeah, the, this is right. This is when when we we forget what the the, the origin, the provenance of university, which was in. The monastery and now since we have cut that off um yeah we we are left with those institutions which are right and there's this book i i've, I've mentioned is in one of my courses with johannes by a german scholar whose name i think is richard munch but it doesn't he wrote a monography on on the he called it the educational in that, industrial it, complex or... something like that because nice. because what happens is academia got captured by capital mm. and it's more now um it's not more it's not right you go there it's more about status um profile creation um but it's not really about the wisdom or, or things that the university was um, um was about in in, uh, in the past so well, if you don't believe in atmosphere, if you don't believe in flow, what's wisdom? All you need is knowledge. You know, um, if there's only mm. the if there's only the objects in a room per se, if there's no atmosphere, if there's only the um, you know physical body, there's no possible flow state, which is this emergent phenomenon that kind of comes when the mind and the body and the physical all come together. You don't need wisdom. I mean, wisdom is all in the wisdom is very much. Um, maybe always, it seems to be, dealing with these harmonies, these between spaces, these atmospheres, these things you can glimpse but not totally set your eye on and then it's gone, these evanescences. That the thing is, you know, we have that paper where we brought it up in the philosophy of lack on the difference between explanation and address. You know, if I explain um, how I got into this office, I say I walked up the steps and I sat down and, you know, turned on Zoom to have a wonderful time with you. That doesn't necessarily address why I've come and sat down in this room. I did it because we're friends and I love speaking with you and that I love doing this. And so there's the, the address is the why, the explanation is the how. Well, address is about wisdom. Uh, and that means we find address as human beings in observing the between spaces and upholding certain conditions that create glimmers of those between spaces and that make it possible for us to return to those between spaces. Yeah, yeah, but if we don't have practices of upholding those conditionality, well, then all we have is explanation. We have the horizontal and not the vertical. We have the body, but not the person. And so then we're explained away. When you have explanation without address, you get explained away. Now, arguably in the past, they had address and not explanation. You know, religions and genesis, you know, they had stories of address, but they didn't explain. And the problem with that is that it's fragile. You know, if you have address, but then you encounter the real world that shows that that address can't also be an explanation, you get a problem. 
Uh, but now we've gone very far on the side of explanation, so everyone feels explained away. And since we don't have any categories like high order complexity, low order complexity, or the difference between, you know, we don't have any kind of thinking in terms of the betweenness, we don't know how to address because you have to go to the between spaces to find the wisdom for upholding the conditionality that makes possible address. And that's also, if you cannot do that, all you'll ever find in your life is a house, you'll never find a home. Because what's the difference between a house and a home? Same building, but an entirely different atmosphere, an entirely different set of relations, an entirely different set of conditions that are upheld. And one one more thing, right? That that all of this discloses is is really the inter and, and this is also in Tanizaki, this interpenetration between let's say practice and structure. Mm. And and when you have only practice, let's say because we, we are never out of practice. Even when we say you have to do the practices, you, you never stop practicing. You do any, you always do a kind of comportment in the world. That's just what of course is, sure is a kind of like a, a facticity let's say of human life but if this if this holding is insufficient or it's more like an unholding a constant clutching let's yes. say in, in your ter terminology then what becomes is then then the structures also change right Absolutely. And then, then you see okay you, you go around in the world and, and every, right this is this this is just the, the, this in heidegger's words right then we disclose the world as gestell, as a standing reserve, as as mm. kind of like um, this this what what instru then instrumental rationality can calculate with everything that's with the world and the things in the world, but they 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 seem right things seem like they they don't have any value. No. It's 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 they're just but it's it's nothing with beings, in a sense. Um, and and that's and also how the world then then you have I don't know a huge plastic island in the Pacific right. and you have you have other other right um, all, all sorts of things that are really not not pleasant to to look at. Oh no! And so so practice and structure really go together. And, and right then in in Japan you said it before, if everything's illuminated all the time people work all day right because this natural right this natural break let's Order. say break yeah. of the night and then we know okay now it's now it's time to go to sleep that that kind of like na call of nature to go to sleep like that fades away that's right and then we, we just work all the time that's also the only reason <laughs> the only reason why why in japan right they have they don't have right people often think this right they go to japan to Tokyo and they think why aren't the, the the trains going all like all night? It could right, it could right. What, what's what's because if trains would go all night, then they wouldn't go even go home. Yeah, that's the only home. thing that they, because because in Japan Japanese society, the going to the last train is like a is like an accepted phrase, right? So mm. you can steal yourself away and and saving face, so to say. Mm. And, and that's important because then then some people never get home right but if if, if let's say if, if that would if, if train would also um never stand still then they would stay at the, in company all the time and, oh, yeah. and so, so that's that's one reason but you see how how constant illumination then creates a structure that's right that then reflects back on our comportment, which becomes more and more insufficient and ultimately nihilistic and, and exacerbating this thing we call the meaning crisis. Absolutely. And that's just another example of how there, there's a high order causality that results from having the trains run all the time. There's no yeah, yeah, law yeah. in nature. There's no law in nature that says if the train runs all the time, that people have to stay at work all the time. But that's what happens because of cultural expectations, because of ways of thinking, because of psychology, and so on and so forth. So if you don't have an awareness of high order causality, then you're probably going to create a structure that has unintended consequences that contribute to nihilism. And that seems to generally have been what have, have occurred. Who would have thought that artificial lighting could have potentially created such a situation? Well, 
Arguably, we can never think of every unintended consequence, but at least, at least if we know about the category of high order causality, we might consider that and thus replace the dark, the night, the natural night um, structure, nighttime, replace it with something else to maintain a manageable structure. That, I mean, and that goes back to a point you were saying earlier. We don't think, of, we just invent things and then don't think about what we're losing with that invention, that to not have that loss, we need to create something new or create a new, a new, social, a new social value or a new practice. Um, you know, you were mentioning the, um, the adolescence, the extended adolescence are different things. In the past, if, you know, before the 1950s or 1940s, when you had less birth control or different things like that, you would naturally, if you you had sex, which was a high likelihood, you would naturally become an adult. You know, you had sex, you were therefore an adult, right? Well, now with birth control, it is not necessarily the case that there will be a practice inherently that will make you go from being an adolescent to an adult. Arguably, this is a good thing. Everything is trade-offs. It's like Postman said with technology, there's always benefits and losses. But here's the problem. If you create birth control and therefore remove a natural practice to transition into adulthood or have a sense of this is what this phase of life and this is the next phase, you have to replace it with another practice so people know where the transition can occur, per se. If you don't do that, then it's all just arbitrary. It's just random opinion on the dip. Maybe an adult is someone who has a career. Maybe an adult is someone who graduated from college. Maybe an adult is someone who's 30 with $100,000 into the bank. Who decides? It's all random. Because here's the thing. If you don't own practices, you're still going to do practices. They're just going to be random, arbitrary, and not have an agreed upon meaning. And that's going to fragment the society and pull everything apart. So one of the things that we've done, because we just assume that more you know, options is good in the same way that we assume more freedom is good because this is what we do. We say, oh, well, if the train's on all the time, you can go home when you want. And that's a good thing. You don't have to stay at the office all the time. You could, but now you could if you wanted to. And maybe sometimes that will be a good thing. So you've increased your freedom by doing that. But actually what you've done is more freedom is not always good because although in theory, the increased freedom is good because you can go home at different times, in practice, what happens is nobody ever goes home from the office. There's a break between theory and practice given the social expectations, the psychology and the social norms, which by the way, will not be checked and balanced or channeled to something good if people don't even own the fact that they need to replace what was what was the, the loss of givenness with a new practice. And that's what's happening is we are removing givenness, we're removing restriction, we're increasing possibility, we're increasing options without mm -hmm. putting in place practices to make that real that Lacan would talk about manageable and handleable and something that we want. Because what ultimately is the freest entity of all? What is the freest entity of all? Nothingness. Nothingness doesn't have any boundaries. It doesn't have any lines, doesn't have any borders. It could do anything because it isn't defined in any way whatsoever. And what is nothingness that leads to nihilism? So that's what's happening is you have, there's no practices. So there's no definition. And when there's no definition, then what ends up happening is nihilism because nobody control. And, and again, I would argue now the Hegelian in me will come out and say that a world where you have birth control, if people integrate practices by which they use those options in a good way, could possibly give rise to better worlds than what was known in the past, because you can do different things and have different options in the same way that the internet, if you develop practices to use the internet, could give you a world that is perhaps the best of all possible worlds. The issue is that it's not necessarily the case. That, that, will, that the best of all possible worlds will arise if people do not implement practices by which to use the thing. You know, the way I like, you know, Cadell and I will talk about Hegel is um, Hegel is progressive, but it's a contingent progress. And although the world, if it continues, gets better, it also, if it doesn't continue, it's the worst of all possible worlds. <laughs> you know, you either, it's like the, the divide kind of opens up. And so similarly, when we, we just assume that increased options means increased good. When all it does is maybe increase good, but actually, if we don't develop the right practices, it increases the bad. Ah, the same act that increases the possible good increases the bad if you don't develop practices by which to use that good. And that's the, that's the key. And that's why you have to have both of the practices and the upholding of conditionality and the awareness of the world around you and the awareness of the trade-offs of the train station and having a schedule. And if you're not aware of those things, if you're not paying attention, which if you're drunk on Western education, that would just have you exist in the realm of the mind. So you're not gonna pay attention to the conditionality of the shadows per se. Well then, yeah, 
you're going to get a freaking meaning crisis because you're not going to have an awareness of what conditionality needs to be upheld for the optimization of the human. <laughs> that that was that was excellent, and I, I have I, I don't know who, I don't know who was it, but I have I have this in mind now, right? This the gap between let's say technological progress and let's say ethics, virtues, practice. Mm. This gap, if, 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 if we cannot close that gap, we go extinct. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> because, because technological progress will just go, go on. Yeah, before I forget, the funny phrase I like to say with Hegel yeah. is the world gets better or it's over. <laughs> you know, the world gets better or it's like, it's like over. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, <laughs> so, so I, mean, I mean, right, in a meaning crisis, right? There's, there's a lot at stake, let's say. There's a lot at stake. And, and yes. I mean, what you say, right, with, with Platonism, let's say, if we, if we can return, if we can recover, let's say, our roots, this, let's say, the Platonism that we have inhabited for so long, then we, 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 we are also able to place again, right? Hierarchy is everything in Plato. We are able to place again all those things that are not free floating everywhere. And we can, we can, we can create kind of like, we can unify the world again, right? That, mm. that we don't, to, to use my example from before, that we don't have to commute between the university and the Zen monastery, but that we can bring them together and have again structures that are, um, um, homing, let's say, all mm. those paradoxical elements. Maybe, let's say, that that are able to structures that are able to transform the contradictions and transmute them into paradoxes, into living, dynamic, flowing paradoxes. Mm. That's that's kind of, I think, absolutely um, what what we what we need to do, and then we can have. And we can have children and we can have, we can have adolescents and we can have adults because all of these things, we can have shadows and we can have light, we can have, we can have, um, we can have memory as well. And, 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 um, forgetting all those things that, that are so, so, um, um precious and important for human life. Then, then they kind of like get a place again. Mm. It's a, it's, that That's, I think, and a, a, really a locus, right? Just as, I mean, one, one example that always comes to my mind is with marriage, right? Marriage is like this optimal locus for the, 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 the mutual contradiction between the, the male and female. And instead of like just, de like Derrida did, deconstructing all oppositions. Oh, sure. Um, and, and leaving them in, in, in a deconstructed void. We need we need Platonism as a kind of as a kind of um, as a spiritual grammar that 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 provides us with Loki where where those um, where we can um, um, productively let's say work with those those tensions. Well, well, it's funny. Pretty recently, I was um, I, I may have mentioned this to you. I was reviewing uh, Book Seven of the Republic because I was kind of looking at all these different translations of um, mm. the uh, the parable, you know, the cave allegory, of the cave. Because yeah. I was inspired yet again by Johannes to uh, to do these things. Because uh, he has those videos where he was talking about the cave, and um, it was very interesting. Because then I got later into Book Seven, and you know, great books. I great books are the ones that when you read again or you look at, you're like, oh, I I should have read this thirty more times by now. What was I thinking? Because I got to this section in Book Seven. And it really struck me where he was talking about the planets. He was talking about orbits. And it was really interesting because he was kind of like um, Black or who, whoever Socrates, Plato, you know, is speaking with. Uh, he's kind of like, is it good to study the heavenly spheres? And Plato's like, uh... Yeah, but maybe not. It might be better to do geometry because it's invisible, but it's also got a structure. And what was really interesting is he kind of suggests that it's actually bad to study the heavenly spheres because they're too perfect. And so you're just going to look at them and you're not going to actually learn the forms by which the world come together. This first, this struck me because I'm like, you usually, you know, as you know, culturally form equals perfection, right? It's like platonic forms are perfect. But what was so curious is I started, I wrote, uh, you know, because I, I, uh, you know, I tried to write it out is it's almost like what for me it was getting at is that forms are more like orbits like they're things that planets form they're kind of and this might be entirely wrong it's just how it struck me is you often hear about forms as the form of the cup is the perfect cup 
right? You know, but really, if the form is instead the kind of trajectory, the kind of orbit that a cup follows in becoming itself, and how it maintains a cup. And yeah, sure, of course, logically, it would eventually lead to the quote unquote perfect cup. But almost that logical extension is secondary to the fact of the formulating principle of the cup according to its cupness. And what this would mean is that without form, the intelligibility of a cup as a cup cannot be maintained. Likewise, a society that is incapable of seeing itself in terms of forms, finding forms or formulating itself according to that forms cannot have shared intelligibility. It cannot have definition. It cannot have purpose. It cannot have direction. And so what you're saying about reclaiming the forms, when I think about it in terms of orbit, you know, like a tract that a moon follows, like us following and being formed, then yeah, the loss of forms equals the loss of the ability for society, basically. And then what do you get? What did Aristotle teach us? Without society, man's either an animal or a god, right? Um, and then that almost could get us into all of the, uh, the inequality, the splitting of the classes. There's this kind of splitting that goes down in different things. And it would see that if you don't have a culture, because practice is a formulating principle. When you practice X, and you discipline yourself to X, X functions as a kind of formulating principle. And if you don't have practices, then even if you have an, an a, um, intellectual form, maybe what you define yourself as, as Daniel, you know, you have your idea of who you are, that doesn't matter if you don't freaking practice it. You know, if the, play, if the moon has an idea of an orbit and it doesn't move, well, who cares? The orbit has to have, the, the, the moon has to practice the orbit. So I think there's a lot, I think what you're getting at on the reclaiming of forms um, for shared intelligibility and movement, I think is absolutely um, is abs absolutely important. And then after meeting that conditionality, upholding, holding yeah. up the forms is just critical. And that's what art and um, yes. pri religious praises always have helped us to, right? Yes. To, to, to do, right? Um, um, so in, in that sense, um, very, very, I'm um, speaking really at hand, let's say practically, that that's just what um, what this is all about, right? Mm. Um, and then, then, right, that the world becomes more beautiful. We get the kind of sense, right, the true, the good, and the beautiful. All those things may come back. Um, in our, oh, yeah. And, and, and then, then, right, then, then this, again, with this kind of like dichotomy of interpenetration of structure and practice, then the structure of the world, the look of the world, the look of society, all those things may also change. That, that's why I'm, I'm yeah, I, I suggested that we, we need to um, recover the, the spiritual grammar of, of, of the past in order to, in order to, to get out of the, this meaning crisis of, of today. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, he has a part in Praise of Shadows where he says something like the beautiful always comes from the real, you know, and he talks about mm -hmm. the uh, the old cup that uh, it's where the gold gets that sort of use, that kind of luster and that that's the beauty of it. Yeah. Uh, that if um, and it's kind of funny, too, because is it was shabby? Is it the philosophy of the imperfect? What cup? I can't recall. I think it's such a W. Um, where is that kind of that idea that a perfect bowl, you know, that come, must have come right off the assembly line and therefore it has no character. And also it's kind of impersonal. But the moment I drop the bowl and it shatters and then I glue it back together, that is now the only bowl in the entire world that will ever be that bowl. And that is inherently meaningful. When you get to the point where you have like that radical one of oneness, that's one of the reasons art has meaning is because it's this is the only Mona Lisa. This is a painting. This is Dante. There's a one of oneness to it. Brokenness can create a art and beauty yeah. and use and story and story that you can't get off the assembly line. Well, that means being broken and being in the real is critical to having meaning. But if you get broken and don't know how to internalize channel and use that brokenness in a manner that elevates you, that sublimates you to something more, well, then you're just broken. But in order to do that, you need practices. So what's happening today? You know, people are encountering these situations that break them, but since they don't have practices or philosophies or ways of being that can see the beauty or that or can channel it in a manner that creates a beauty, they just end up in a mental health crisis. And unfortunately, uh, Western philosophy doesn't necessarily give you practices to glue the bowl back together. 
what Western Western thinking can do is say, here's a perfect bowl. It's straight off the assembly line. And you go, yay, and you put it in your cabinet and you're all good to go until the day it falls out the cabinet and hits the floor. Without Eastern thought, you do not have any glue to put the bowl together again. And even if you did, without Eastern thought, you'll think of the bowl as broken, as something wrong with it. You won't see any beauty in it. And that's what's happening in the West. That's so much of the meaning crisis is, is people are getting broken and hurt and are encountering the real, encountering the actual, um, encountering the train that runs 24 seven and not being able to uh, you know, um, navigate the social pressure so that they don't end up uh, miserable. Um, but they don't have any practices or ways to glue the bowl back together. And even if they do, they don't have the eyes to see beauty in that brokenness, this radical one of oneness, because all of that requires practices. All of that requires training your mind to resist the thought when it enters your brain. When the thought enters your brain that says, oh, it's just a broken bowl. Oh, it's no good. You know, you have to have the training and the practice to capture that thought and do away with it. You know, control your thinking, control your mind. And when your friends come in and say to you, oh man, that bowl is broken. You ought to throw it away. It's no good. You have to have done the practices to emotionally handle that where you don't question every decision you've made in your life, right? Mm. You're only, I promise you beliefs, beliefs alone won't be enough. You will have had to have practiced courage. You will have to have practiced emotional temperament. You will have to have practiced things so that you can handle that social pressure, which if you can't, you're just going to have a bunch of assembly line bowls. I mean, I mean, what, what you said, right? If, if we really just, just look, let's say, at the, at the perfect, perfected state, I mean, that this is also terrifying. It's really terrifying because then, then we, we are never allowed to... to the permanence kind of like we, 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 we right we have to we, we, we have to also be appreciative of of the world of becoming yes the world of permanence where everything changes where all is impermanent and traditionally speaking in japan right wabi sabi um all those well was like that's it that's it. i'm glad right? you, i guess it was the w word those, i couldn't think of it those those as <laughs> right those aesthetics um but famous example is for example, right, with tea bowls, you have mm. when they break, they kind of like have a technique that's called kintsugi, where you fill in like golden wow. lacquer to repair it. And that's kind of like how you transcend, let's say, again, where you transform again, let's say, the, the brokenness of that that object that wow. can become beautiful. But in, in, in general, right? An appreciation of let's say what is broken what is what is imperfect this is even nishitani makes this argument against aristotle in, in religion and nothingness because in reality things are not right they kind of like are always falling off their state of, of finality mm. we never achieved this this perfect finality right that kind of like aristotle was dreaming up but we always like things in reality are always broken, always in, in, in fragile, always um, um, cr cracking up, so to say. And in, in, in human in human so in human life, right? We have sin, we have crime, we have fallenness, we have ignorance, we have all those things. Um, mm. And he tried to so this was his argument against Aristotle. So that that the field of emptiness gives us a kind of ontology where we can also include those things and then do not um but that's a that's a that's a like digression what i want to say is if if we if we we, we are surrounded by by perfect objects all the time right it's true yes they are all perfectly geomet geometrical mm. but, but an object like that never occurs in nature you you never mm. find like like those things with geometrical shapes that are perfect you never find them in nature so the ideas and also the virtual right has really broken into our world and kind of like now now we are right and now we are kind of like we are also becoming more and more obsessed with perfection right perfect images perfect ideals think of instagram accounts where mm. everything is where everything's fake mm. um and and so this is why I also like Japanese philosophy, kind of like an appreciation of the real mm. in 
comparison to the ideal and that we need a kind of like interpenetration of both again holding us in the middle space where we can say okay there is the ideal and the intelligible but there's also like the the world down here the corrupted world so to say the impure world and that we need to hold ourselves in an in-between space between those two worlds um yeah. because right this is really terrifying right I mean, there are, those, there are those parents nowadays who kind of like make their children their projects. And then if the children do not, um, do not um, live up to that image, then they're kind of like, um, um, I don't know, seen as unworthy or so, right? Mm. What, what do you then do really with, the, with those people who are broken, who are um, cracked up, right? Do you don't, we, we don't, we don't want, we, we just can't kick them out right i mean that then we would live we would end up in a very cruel society and every human being is in a sense broken like if you want it or not we are because we because we are fragile um so so those are just some of my my no <laughs> you know if you know outstanding uh um first off you know when the uh, when the big black obelisk came down in 2001 space obviously the monkeys knew it wasn't natural so you know they they knew but we seem to have forgotten we we <laughs> had a discussion of this on sunday Did you right? <laughs> sunday on in johannes's course and i was saying the same thing the breaking in of this of this ideal form and then I was I was rambling on about this kind of like this platonic stuff and like no it's perfect. Like today and in, in, in space odyssey I said this in, in the middle you have you have the obelisk and people are not noticing it kind of like doing all this stupid stuff and today we are surrounded with forms all the time yes but we're not noticing it we are we are just going into the last man direction like That's right. Nietzsche we 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 we, we, we see this occurrence. In Heidegger's words, right? This this event of technics, and we don't realize it. We are completely blind and 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 stupefied, and we, we don't see what's going on. So so it's very it's tragic. It's truly tragic. Yeah, uh, you know, I think like every other paper I do references the whole doorknob <laughs> thing in Heidegger, where we don't know when do like we don't even notice a doorknob anymore until it's broken. I can't not use that idea because it's so important. And you see, like in a you know in religion and nothingness, he talks about you know we don't really see anymore. He talks about Dostoevsky seeing the people playing the country. So much of what actually makes all the difference in the world is just to actually remember the fact that this is a cell phone and it's not natural. And just the very act of remembering that transforms how you use it in a manner that makes it makes it a good thing instead of a bad thing. Like I was talking about birth control and technologies and different things. Just remembering the fact that it's not natural greatly increases the probability that it is used in a good way versus a bad way. Because, you know, Johannes was talking about how Heidegger is not anti-technology. No, it's, it's not anti-technology. It's about the nature. There is something about technology, um, if we stick to that example, that becomes invisible where it's yeah. like has an invisibility to it, where you stop thinking about it as different in being from the tree. All of it becomes the same. And in losing that distinction, then you are lost as well because you lose the distinction of yourself with it. And so you just become part of the smoothness and the flatness. And then, yeah. you know, you're, that, has a lot of, uh, that has a lot of trouble. What, what was with Space Odyssey? I'm really curious what, what the, I, I, I interrupted you. No, <laughs> I was just saying how like the monkeys knew that the obelisk when they came down, there was something weird about it. But today the iPhone shows up and we mm, don't think there's yeah, anything yeah, yeah. weird about it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, at least it's almost like the animals were more philosophically wise than we are, <laughs> you know, at yeah. the beginning of Def it. Definitely, yeah, definitely. And, um, and you so and so you know um, the other thing that's important, like we talk about, um, you know, the brokenness and 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 so on and so forth. Um, you know, in one sense, if I go over, so I, uh, you know, I love my, I got like uh, this 1999 Altima that I just love uh, because it's like gone up a mountain. It was buried in six foot of snow. It's like the toughest car on planet Earth, and I'm just gonna drive it till it explodes, right? Um, and I love that. I, I think it's wonderful. In a sense, you could say, oh, the car is breaking down. Well, the very, why not say it's storing up per se? It's like increasing in story, like storying up. The very, from one perspective, it's breaking down, but from another perspective, it's gaining in story. It's storing up per se. And I'll have to think of a better phrase, but, but it's funny how what you get in the Japanese thought that you were mentioning is an understanding that it's not mere, yeah, sure, it's breaking, but it's not only breaking. 
it's also gaining character. And so you're holding a multiplicity of variables yeah. um, together. In the West, we just think it's broken. Now, here's the trick. If something breaks and becomes dangerous, well, then, we, then we're no longer dealing with character. We're dealing with a potential threat, right? You know, if you're driving your car and it breaks down to the point where it is dangerous, well, now you want a new car because it is dangerous. But before something becomes, and that can be a gray line. It's not always easy to tell when something is dangerous or just broken. Um, but, but we don't even, we just assume that if it's broken or cracked at all, that it's dangerous and you need to get rid of it. Um, as opposed to realizing that it's a trade-off. Yeah, sure, the cracked bowl maybe is dangerous because it could break while holding hot soup and mm -hmm. burn you and something. I mean, we can all come up with crazy stories. Um, but we, but, but, but maybe not. Maybe it's actually storied. Maybe it's more beautiful. How can you tell the difference? How can you tell the difference? By really looking at it. By really, really looking at it, which is a practice which is an artistic practice, which is a practice stressed in religion and nothingness. Um, the, the key point that is so funny, and then I, um, I suppose I need to go to work or something, uh, you know, and make for, uh, there's a rumor going on. Um, the, the key argument that you gotta, if we, I would argue that literally sitting down one day and, ta and taking the pieces of a broken bowl and gluing them together in the way that you described, that the practice of doing that will actually mysteriously help you if you get fired from your job to not think that therefore you're worthless. There is a mysterious high order causality relationship between practices like gluing a bowl together and the ability to handle getting fired from your job. We don't believe in that. You know, we don't really believe in that. So we tell people that you're valuable no matter what, self-esteem, and then don't give them any practices. So it doesn't become emotional. It's an idea. And then when the emotion of the experience of getting fired hits them, it instantly overrides the idea that they have intrinsic value and different things like that. But it is an emotional experience to glue a bowl together. There's emotion that comes with that. There's patience. There's paying attention. And so that's an experience, which then when you encounter the experience of getting fired from your job or ending up in third place or whatever, it's not a mismatch. You have an experience that can help you handle the experience. But if you only have an idea, ideas are very weak compared to experiences. Experiences knock them out instantly. Um, so practices, because ideas are not experiences. That's an important idea. The idea of um, the idea of say wrestling is not equivalent to the experience of wrestling or a sport or different things. It can seem like it. Ideas like to present themselves as if they're equivalent. They convince you that they're equivalent because your brain believes they're equivalent, but they're not. They're not at all. Without practices, which is one of the reasons why I'm so I just think it's so wonderful that your class incorporates that, and because so many classes don't, so people get ideas that are weak compared to the experiences of life, and then those experiences instantly eclipse the ideas, and the ideas don't go far enough. Practices like the literal act of gluing a bowl together creates an emotional experience that changes your life, as opposed to simply knowing that a glued bowl that a bowl glued together can have a beauty. The practice of doing it creates an entirely different kind of being that will better train you to uphold the conditions that are needed for you to handle getting fired from your job. And then if you can handle that, you can actually sublimate that experience to create an even more engaging story, therefore give your life meaning, therefore overcome the meaning crisis. Two things, um, right? Plato says, right, the, the practice of philosophy, what, what helps it with? Is it, it's a preparation for death. Yes. So the, the, ultimate, the ultimate fragility, the ultimate contingency of human life, we can become, right, in Heidegger's words, we can become mortals then Absolutely. if we practice this, if we, we let us into that practice and, and we, 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 we invite, let's say, also the, the, the brokenness and, and all of that. Second thing is I will send you some links or some a little, a little text uh, so, so you can, everyone who's listening to Excellent. this, finding this can find um, the, the page of the Halcyon Guild and, um, and access um, how you can um, access the course and, and get in, right? If you want to participate in the course, how you can buy it. Um, 
yeah, again, we will have six, no, we will have seven, seven seminars, six normal seminars, one pro seminar where you can present something, um, a talk or, or a poem or a song or whatever that, that you like. Um, and in the, in most of the, most of the seminars, we will also have talk, um, um, room for philosophical speculation, but mm. um, we will also do some practices like mindfulness, philosophical fellowship, the dialectic into dialogos, which is a kind of Socratic um, style dialectic. And yeah, that's, that's just all. And, and there will be classical seminars as well, where you just like, they give you questions and you can discuss them with your peers. And yeah, that, that's all I, I would mm. Well, magnificent. I um, I have no doubt that everyone who takes the class will wonder where I have no idea where the last two hours went, uh, because talking with you is just so wonderful. Just boom, just like that. And no doubt that will be the exact same experience that people have in the class. And I really want to stress, like, uh, you know, it's so rare to find someone who is so passionate, um, aware of and competent in and talented in, in practicing Eastern thought. Um, to benefit other people. It's, it's an entire horizon, a house of being, to use that language, that people don't know about. And it's just wonderful that there's an opportunity for people to find that house, to enter into that house, and then practice in a manner that turns it into a home, because you just simply cannot find that. And so it's very wonderful that you are offering that. I encourage it to everyone. Um, the discussion, I, I find you always engaging with your, the recents you've done with Mr. Viveki, Johannes, those conversations, classes, um, and the work, uh, the texts that you bring to light that are forgotten by many people that should not be forgotten. And I greatly appreciate the work that you're doing. And we will certainly uh, include those descriptions, links, uh, put them so that people can find them. And I encourage everyone to, uh, to take the class at the Halkion Guild. So, Mr. Zaruba, thank you so much for your time and blessings to all that you do. Thank you for your work. Thank, thank you, you for being you. And thank you for this opportunity. It's been a delight. Thank you as well for inviting me and having me on. It was, all, as always, a pleasure. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Mr. Zaruba.